This episode goes to all my diehard General Motors fans out there. How well do you know your favorite car maker? Have you ever heard about Ranger? No? Then welcome everyone to the 42nd episode of the Automotive History series that takes place in continental Europe for a change. That is about some next level obscure rebadging and model sharing trickery, which is also extremely confusing. That is about six nations working together to make a car. That is about the story of the GM Ranger. Around the 1920s, the American car manufacturers already achieved a solid worldwide presence. American cars could be found in the far corners of the world. At one point in time, half the cars in the entire world were that of the Ford Motor Company. The Ford Model T proved durable and could take on almost any terrain and road surface and was easy to maintain. Rivaling General Motors also had a strong world presence, but through a different tactic. Instead of offering one solid car and selling it everywhere, the General bought itself in into the local markets by acquiring local car brands that already had some name and fame. It continued to sell its larger American models under their own name in these countries, but also offered usually smaller cars under the local brand name to better suit the local market. By the 1950s, General Motors owned, besides its American divisions, Vauxhall in the UK, acquired in 1925, Holden in Australia, acquired in 1926, and Opel in Germany, acquired in 1931. GM was also active in numerous other countries, but mostly sold larger cars from its American divisions over there. Whereas in the early years, many of these brands I just mentioned had their own identity and mostly figured out things themselves, but over time, under the watchful eye of GM, the brands changed to become more uniform in production. But by the 1960s and 70s, in the light of increasing globalization and rebadging of the car industry, some of these brands were closer related to one another than they would like to think. Around the start of the 1970s, there was a little turmoil within the international lineup of GM. It seemed like the downfall of the British car industry, mostly caused by British Leyland, also affected Vauxhall. Union strikes, increased labor costs and low build quality affected Vauxhall, not to mention their range of rather mundane and not so exciting family cars. German Opel, on the other hand, was a rising star. The West German car company dominated the European car sales, and as my father recalls it, you could practically see an Opel on every street corner. Uh, his first car was an Escona A. Besides its compact cadets, Opel also reached far into luxury car territory, with its flagship the Diplomat, featuring American styling and dimensions, as well as an optional American engine. The Chevy small block 5.4... that's not a small block, that's a huge engine... 5.4 liter or 327 cubic inch V8, a rather un-European engine. And who could forget the sporty Opel Manta, and the Opel GT, lovingly nicknamed the Baby Corvette. Yeah, Opel had some fun stuff. And right in that sweet spot, right at the moment when Opel was rising and Vauxhall was falling, GM decided to launch a new brand that would combine the best of both worlds. Let's see how that would play out. Before we take a look at it and try to untangle this confusing story, we first have to fly down to South Africa, where in 1968 GM launched a new brand called Ranger. It was another one of those GM's brilliant brainwaves. GM operated Chevrolet Opel dealers and Pontiac Vauxhall dealers. So far so good. But in an effort to meet local content and production targets set by the South African government, GM decided to launch a new brand as a replacement for Vauxhall. The Vauxhall Victor series would no longer continue with a new generation of models. Instead, the brand was scrapped and replaced by GM Ranger. Yes, that's the full name under the tagline, South Africa's own car, because, hey, it was produced locally. But here's the fun part. The Ranger wasn't exactly an entirely new car built from the ground up and entirely developed in South Africa. Instead, it was heavily based on an Opel, with a Chevrolet engine and with some leftover Vauxhall bits glued onto it. Really, mechanically, it was an Opel record, with a Vauxhall grille, badging and interior appointment. So, GM Ranger, it's an Opel, with Vauxhall trim. Are you still with me? Good, because let's fly back to Europe. As mentioned before in Europe, Vauxhall dealers 
outside the UK found it increasingly challenging to sell their cars because of lackluster build quality and holes in their lineup, especially compared to Opel. So the non-UK divisions GM Swiss of Switzerland and GM Continental of Belgium hatched a plan. They wanted to offer a large two-door sedan and coupe, like the Opel Record, but the similar Vauxhall Victor only came as a four-door. Now what? Well, they looked at GM South Africa, found a local Ranger brand over there that did offer a large two-door car and decided to ship it back to Europe. And thus, in 1970, the Ranger brand was born. The Ranger A was nothing more than an Opel record with a Vauxhall Victor front clip glued onto it and was sold in Switzerland and the Benelux countries, so Belgium, Netherlands and Luxembourg. The Rangers were sold alongside other Vauxhall models, but limited in such a way not to compete with the four-door only Victor. I hope you can understand that this leads to much confusion, and it's a move that I think is very hard to justify. Why go the extra mile to make an entirely new brand that no one has ever heard of? What's so hard at creating just a two-door Vauxhall? Why is it essentially a mix between Opel and Vauxhall with a different name that doesn't really solve the problem? Why not just send Opel bodies over to Vauxhall and rebatch them as Vauxhall? Why make it so complicated? Because here is a little anecdote. When the first Ranger was bought in the Netherlands, it was bought by an older man who used to buy Opals. Not only did he receive a Ranger, but also a celebratory box with various alcoholic beverages from the countries that took part in the creation of the Ranger brand. Like wine from South Africa, where the Ranger brand was founded, wine from France, the automatic transmission came from Strasbourg, Kirsch from Switzerland, because the Swiss came up with the idea to bring the Ranger back to Europe, beer from Germany, because the Ranger had Opel underpinnings and body, beer from Belgium, oh, my favorite, because the car was assembled over there, whiskey from England, because of the Vauxhall trim and front clip, and Dutch gin, because the car was sold in the Netherlands. I won't be making comments about drunk driving, but I also think that the celebratory box was almost kind of like a parody on the whole Ranger brand. And the box pretty much sums up the whole Ranger story. It's an absolute mismatch of brands and countries, and the automotive press quickly picked up on it. Although the car sold fairly well in Europe, even car magazines openly asked what GM's idea exactly was, and what they wanted to achieve with a brand that is based on already existing other brands. Where was the added value in that? That. Even in the corporate back rooms, the Ranger was referred to as an Opal with great lights, because it had four headlights instead of the usual two. But of course, no single Opal badge could be found on a Ranger. Oh no. In 1972, the first Ranger model, simply known as the A, was replaced by a refreshed model named the B in South Africa. How original. But was named the 2 in Europe, to make this all even more confusing. GM Swiss and Continental presented the Ranger 2 alongside the new Opel Record D, and the cars were practically identical save from some exterior trim. The Ranger would soldier on for a couple years, but increasing wages in Switzerland resulted in a potential higher sticker price and thus became unattractive to produce over there, and the production stopped in 1975. The Belgian plant would keep building them until 1978, however. By then, worldwide GM had seen the light, and went all in on platform sharing and rebadging in an effort to bring down production costs, and also launch so-called world car platforms. World cars are cars that are developed once in such a way that they can be sold virtually everywhere without too many changes. Like the GM T-Car platform, one of the most rebadged cars of all time. There was no room for Ranger to exist in this strategy and the brand was cancelled, after being active for about 10 years in total. Vauxhall lost an Opel-based car in their showroom, but the new Vauxhalls would now be based on Opel bodies, but with Vauxhall badging. And this practice continues until today. Virtually every Opel model I know is sold as a Vauxhall in the UK, and were also formerly sold as Holdens in Australia and Buicks in the US as well. But Ranger? Never heard of it.